Good morning, good morning. Or, yeah, it's still morning. All right, good morning. <clears throat> Please turn to Philippians chapter 2 in your Bibles. Philippians chapter 2. Again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Sunley, one of the pastors here at West Grove, married to my godly and beautiful wife, Kayleen. We have a two and a half year old son, um, and we have a little girl due in about three and a half weeks. So, uh, yeah, excited for that. That clap is for the mama holding the baby in there for over nine months. So, <laughs> excuse me, keep us in prayer for that. It's a blessing to be able to share from God's word uh, with you this uh, morning. Again, Philippians chapter two is where we'll be. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the book, uh, um, this book of the Bible, such a sweet and powerful, short but powerful uh, book of the Bible. It is one of Paul's prison uh, letters. So he's writing to the church in Philippi uh, while he's in prison because they have sent him a gift. They've sent him some sort, a, some sort of gift. So it's a, a, th a thank you letter of sorts with obviously so much more going on. And, and at this time, years have gone by since Paul first entered uh, the city of, of Philippi. And still, this church has not forgotten or lost any care uh, for this man who first brought the gospel to their city. It's, it's documented in Acts chapter 16. As Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey, they are um, trying to go into certain regions to get the gospel into. And Timothy ends up joining them and, and Luke ends up joining them as well. And the spirit forbids them. Um, from going into certain regions, into certain cities, and multiple times the Spirit forbids them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and then Paul gets a, a vision, a vision of a man from Macedonia who's pleading with him, please come to Macedonia and help us. So finally, after all these closed doors, Paul's like, sweet, here's the open door. Here's where the Spirit is leading us. And so they travel to Macedonia, and the first major city they enter is Philippi. And as they enter into Philippi, this uh, Gentile um, area, this Gentile city, there was no Jewish temple there. Um, there were, this, this city was actually founded by, uh, I believe, by retired military uh, men and their families. So it was a very Gentile um, area. And so where they went was to the riverside because uh, often customarily uh, prayers would be made by the riverside. There was no Jewish temple to go to, to preach to the Jews. So they went to uh, the riverside and they met a group of women there and shared the gospel with them. And Lydia, the Bible says the Lord opened her heart to receive uh, what Paul had preached, the message that he had brought and she, she gets saved. She trusts in Jesus, her and her entire household. And immediately she persuades them to stay at her home, to, to get some rest, no doubt cooking them a meal, giving them a, a place to uh, rest. And as the days go on in, in Philippi, uh, there's this demon-possessed girl uh, who the Bible says uh, began to annoy Paul with everything that she was saying to him. And finally, I don't know why, but finally he d decides to deliver this girl. Not sure why he didn't do it the first day, but he finally he uh, frees this girl from this demon. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave her and she is delivered. And then he's thrown into prison. Uh, there's uh, some craziness that goes on. He's thrown into prison. The jailer ends up getting saved. The prisoners end up hearing the gospel. And it is clear God is at work in this city. God, God has people in this city. And I believe from the first day, Paul's heart was given to these people. Uh, from the first day, seeing Lydia, seeing what God was doing. Paul knew this was the hand of God. Paul calls this church, in his letter here, he, he calls them his beloved, longed for brethren. He calls them his joy, his crown. He loves the people in this city. And, and from the first day, they, they, they ministered together with him in the gospel from Lydia taking them in. And he says, even to this day, 
as, as they've sent him a gift. They haven't lost that care for their apostle Paul. Now Paul's in prison writing this letter, encouraged, remembering that first day, and, and encouraged because God was still at work in them. Now what I want us to focus on this morning is three examples uh, found for us in this letter with a closing statement as our fourth point. So four points, but three examples. First point, it's one sentence, but four points. First point, pour out. Big letters back there. Pour out. Second, the second point, uh, with a pure heart. And I, I didn't want to include the last two because there's a lot. So uh, point three, when others are in need. Fourth point, because we know God. Pour out with a pure heart when others are in need because we know God. Now remember, in, in chapter two, verses five through eight, Paul points us to Christ as our ultimate example. Christ is our ultimate example. He walked in all lowliness. He walked in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than himself, looking out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And Paul says, let this mind be in you. Christian, this is the mindset we are supposed to have. This is what we should be walking around with, thinking like this, in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than yourself, just like Jesus did. I remember the first time reading that passage as a, as a, as a Christian, and immediately I knew I, knew I could not do this on my own. I needed help. I needed the Holy Spirit um, to help me with this. Now, some people might be, well, uh, might be like, well, I, I'm not Jesus uh, I can't do that. I can't have that mindset. I can't humbly obey to the point of death of the cross. And that was probably um, Jesus' little brother's excuse uh, as well. James and Jude, you guys know them, the standard that they must have uh, had to live up to. Mary and Joseph constantly say, hey, be more like your brother Jesus. And they're like, it's impossible. Uh, we cannot be like him. Some people even today say, man, I can't do that. I'm not Jesus. Now, now first of all, God has given us his whole Holy Spirit. We learned about that uh, last week. Uh, our, our helper to empower us to be Christ's witnesses. And not only that, God has given us godly examples here in Philippians who imitated Christ, who followed his, his example, and now they become examples for us. So today we're going to look at three mere mortals, three human beings, sinners like us, three people just like you and me who were obedient to the Lord. Not perfect, but obedient to the Lord. And I love it because this is something that James, Jesus' little brother, actually does. He looks to uh, Elijah as an example for him in his letter, James chapter 5, verse 17. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I have an older brother who was kind of different than I. Elijah, he was a man with a nature like ours. And he was encouraged by Elijah's example in prayer there in James chapter 5. So as we have Christ's example, which is of utmost importance, don't miss that or you're missing the entire central passage of this letter. As we have Christ's example, we also have three examples who followed Christ's example. Now they become examples for us. So let's start with Paul, the apostle, um, the author of this letter, um, a Christian just like us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Philippians 2, 17 and 18. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So point number one, pour out. Paul rejoiced if his life was simply poured out for the church. He talks about uh, being poured out as a drink offering. Now, there were a few different um, offerings that the, that the Jews were uh, commanded to give to the Lord throughout the year. As commanded in the book of Numbers, the people of Israel were first uh, taught about the, uh, the, the burnt offering, to give that burnt offering of one of the prescribed animals to the Lord. And that burnt offering was presenting everything, that, that entire animal, just everything was given as a sacrifice, symbolizing that, that everything, all, our entire bodies, everything is the Lord's. Called to present our bodies to him, a living sacrifice. Some other sacrifices, the priest would get to eat and barbecue on another day and, and the next couple days, but, but that offering was 
to be completely given over to the Lord. Then there was a grain offering and finally a drink offering. You can uh, find more about it in Numbers chapter 15. Uh, a drink offering refers to the topping off of this sacrifice. It would be the topping off of this sacrifice. The worshiper would, would pour wine in front of or either on top of or in front of uh, this, this sacrifice and it would vaporize and that steam would symbolize this sacrifice rising up to the Lord, acceptable to God, well-pleasing to God. So Paul says, even if my life is poured out like a drink offering, even if it's given as the, the topping off of your faith, even if it's given in any small way that your lives would be more pleasing to the Lord, to encourage your faith in Jesus a little more, to encourage your joy in Jesus a little more, he said, I'll rejoice. I'll, I'll, I'm glad. I will be the topping off of your faith. See, Paul wasn't looking to be this famous apostle. He was just looking to be a faithful apostle. And you see that in his willingness and just serving others, caring for others, even in the small sacrifices that were needed. He was willing to pour out his life for others. And I love reading through his letters and here and there you just see glimpses of Paul's heart. He told the Corinthians, he said, I'll labor for your joy. I'll, I'll, I'll get my hands dirty. I'll get sweaty. I'll do the hard work so that your joy in Jesus increases. He said, I'll, I'll endure all things for the sake of the elect. Even in chapter one of Philippians, he said, I will remain. It'd be better to go and be with Christ, but I'll remain for your progress and for your joy and faith. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly spend and be spent. Even thinking about this, man, Paul must have been so encouraging to be around. Uh, you guys know those people that are just so filled with the Spirit, so filled with, with love that you were just drawn to that. You just love that friendship. You love those times of just conversing uh, with them because you are so encouraged. Point number one, pour out. And if I can add a sub point here, uh, pour out even if it seems like it's sig insignificant. Even if it seems like it's something small, like it doesn't matter, like it's a simple uh, a drink offering. Maybe you think there won't be revival because of this one small act. Still, be, still pour out, be faithful in the small things. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, I feel like I have nothing to give. I feel like I have nothing to pour out in the season that I'm in, this, this situation that I'm, that I'm in. What's the answer then? Where do I go from here? And I'll take you back to verse 16, the, the verse prior to verse 17 here in Philippians 2. Paul says that phrase, holding fast the word of life. As we learned a couple of weeks ago, abide in the word of God. I'll say it like this, soak in the word of God or, or you will feel like a desert. You will feel parched. You will feel like you'll have nothing to pour out, but soak in the word of God. Get into the word, let the word of God get into you and you will be able to pour out as the Lord opens doors for you. Get back to the word so you can be filled up so that you can pour out. So we, Paul encourages us to pour out, even if it's a, a small offering. Now, point number two, with a pure heart, continuing the sentence, pour out with a pure heart. Look at verses 19 through 24. Verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth or his proven character. That he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Now, what a statement uh, that is, that Paul knew of no one else. He had no one else with him who would sincerely care, genuinely care for the church in Philippi. All others sought their own. All others looked out for their, their own interests and not the interests of others. 
That's, that, that's a contrast to the Christ-like mind that a Christian ought to have. And Paul says, but I got Timothy. I, I have Timothy, my son in the faith. You, you read both of his letters that Paul writes to Timothy, and you see the relationship that they had. Timothy seeing Paul, meeting Paul, joining his, his missionary journey. Paul says, this is my son in the faith. He will care. And when he, when he arrives, you'll see that he genuinely cares for you and for your souls. He would seek the things of Christ for them. He was a man of proven character, which means he had been tested and been, had been found faithful. He wasn't led by, by greed. He wasn't led by selfishness. He wasn't led by covetousness like others were, but he really loved Jesus and cared about his church. So Timothy encourages us to pour out with a pure heart. I know so often we can be led by just weird, selfish motives that just mix in into our hearts and our minds, just beginning to corrupt us. Like there's something in this for me, or I'm going to get this out of this situation. And it's not a pure heart of pouring out and just giving to others. Or we're so prone to make ourselves the center of attention and everything. And when that happens, uh, man, we just need to pray. We need to pray, pray, and pray, and ask the Lord just to purify our hearts all over again. So the subtitle I would add here is pure, uh, pour out with a pure heart, even if there's no one else living like this. Even if there's no one else living like this. Paul said, there's only Timothy. There's only Timothy. And Timothy, no doubt, would have known Paul's example and have followed Paul and seen his heart and seen his example. And he may have seen some other Christians Maybe living a casual, comfortable Christian life. Uh, maybe on mission here and there or praying or going to church here and there, but weren't completely devoted to Jesus. There might have been temptation for him. Like, man, should I go down this path? Looks easy, looks uh, comfy. I'm going to go down this path rather than the path that Paul's on that didn't look so comfortable. Timothy was a, a man of proven character. He had been tested and found faithful, following Paul's example. And listen, for us here today, God is, God is calling us to learn from Timothy's example in this. Maybe, maybe you've, you've seen examples like Paul, and then you've seen uh, Christians that, that are, have been compromised, and you, you've been joining that crew and going that direction, the compromise, or, or just uh, getting, allowing lukewarmness in certain areas of your life. We're called to follow Timothy's example in this, even if it seems like you're the only one. Even if it seems like, and you're going to be all by yourself. God's calling us to that, to pour out with a pure heart, even if it seems like we're the only ones. Now, not only was there Paul and Timothy, but there was Epaphroditus. Point number three, continuing that sentence, when others are in need. Pour out with a pure heart when others are in need. Look at verse 25. We'll read to the end of the chapter. Verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him and not, not on him only, but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Rece receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. So here is Epaphroditus, crazy name, Crazy dude, this man was willing to come close to death, to serve Christ and to serve others. Paul says, for the work of Christ, he came close to death. Uh, I know many of you remember uh, the documentary Facing Darkness about uh, uh, Kent Bradley and some of those missionary uh, doctors who were in Africa around when it, Ebola uh, bro broke out in Western Africa. Um, it was on the news a few years uh, back. 
uh, these, these missionary doctors, they, they heard about the people in Liberia experiencing Ebola and, and getting Ebola and getting sick and dying, and they, they were compelled. They were compelled to help them. So, so you, you see this documentary, and they're wearing like these space-looking suits just covered from head to toe, and just this crazy process of getting dressed and getting clean and sanitized, getting undressed, and, and this whole thing just to serve these uh, Western Africans, these Li- Liberians who were who were dying from Ebola. And two of these missionary doctors ended up uh, getting Ebola and were on the verge of death, on the verge of dying from this, um, this disease. And they were brought back into uh, the States, or uh, Dr. Kent uh, Bradley was brought back into the States and it was on national television because we were bringing someone with Ebola into the US and everyone's going crazy. And what you see on national news is Kent Bradley in this space looking suit walk out of, a, a, of an ambulance looking completely healthy, walking completely normal, which was not common if you had Ebola, looking like he was completely healed and he was. And you, you, you don't get that behind the news, uh, what God was doing behind the stories kind of thing. Um, sorry, behind the scenes uh, kind of thing of what God was doing from national news. Um, but he was healed. Him and the other missionary doctor were, were healed. God miraculously uh, saved them from death and and it was then because of that national news that the president stepped up and America stepped up and, and helped those in uh, Western Africa. And you see, man, they came close to death for the sake of serving Christ and serving others. I also remember going to uh, China and getting to serve with one of our former missionaries, and she was just sick. Uh, but she was the only translator there leading the way to these, 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 these young Chinese Christians who were just hungry for the word of God in this underground Bible college that was 12 stories up in, uh, it's a contradiction right there, but it was, it's 12 stories. High. She was just translating, just not well. At, at times before we came, she, would, she had IVs in her arm and still just translating, just, just doing the work that she believed she was called uh, to do. Epaphroditus was this kind of servant. And he wasn't some radical missionary doctor. He wasn't some translator, translating English into Mandarin Chinese. He was a delivery boy. He was a mere messenger. And Paul says, esteem these kinds of servants highly. Esteem these kinds of men, these kinds of women highly. He, he saw a need and he filled it. There wasn't a need for a pastor. There wasn't a need for a worship leader. There was a need to deliver this gift to the Apostle Paul. He's like, man, I'll go. I want to go see Apostle Paul. I want to go be encouraged by Apostle Paul. I'll go and deliver this gift from the church to Paul. And Paul said, man, he, he got sick, but he completed that mission that he was on. And I'm going to send you guys back because I know you guys are worried about him. But Epaphroditus man, brought the gift to Paul, brought this letter back to uh, the church. God used him in ways that he couldn't even imagine. So here we are being blessed with this letter because of this delivery boy, because of this mere messenger. And so we learn from Epaphroditus he reminds us to pour out with a pure heart when others are in need. Sub, subtitle or sub point here, even if it costs. Even if it costs. Maybe Epaphroditus didn't know it would, it would hurt. It would cost him health and comfort. But he was willing to complete this journey to deliver this to the apostle Paul, he poured out with a pure heart when others were in need. Now, final point, what kind of people live like this? What kind of people live like this? What kind of people live like Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus? What kind of people give without wanting something in return? What what kind of people love so unconditionally? And the answer is, because I already told you, uh, people who know God. People who know, who truly know God. So point number four, finishing off the sentence, because we know God. Quickly as we close, look at uh, verse one of chapter three, just the first three verses. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. 
To write the same things again is no trouble to me and it, it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Pour out with a pure heart when others are in need because we know God. Paul, Paul here calls the church to rejoice. Rejoice in Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord. And then he gives three warnings. Beware. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Be, beware of the mutilation. And I believe he does this because he's warning them to be watchful, but he doesn't want them to be afraid. He says there should be rejoicing. Yes, be watchful, but rejoice at the same time. And, and these men that he, were, he was describing were these Jewish false teachers who thought they knew God, but because they rejected Jesus, they rejected God. They rejected their relationship with God. Their fellowship with God was severed because they rejected his son. So they knew a lot about the Old Testament. They knew a lot about the scriptures, but they did not know God. Paul calls them dogs. Now there's two words in, in the Greek, uh, in the New Testament, in the, Greek, uh, in the Greek for dogs. One is this cute little, you know, house puppy kind of thing that you want to cuddle with and play with. And the other is the one that's used here. This savage street dog. Unclean, filthy, uh, just a savage beast kind of thing. Paul uses strong, strong language calls them dogs, which was interesting because the Jews would often refer to the Gentiles as dogs, and which was obviously a, mis a, a misunderstanding of God's heart. They were called to be a blessing to the nations, a blessing to the Gentiles, but as self-righteousness crept in, they called the Gentiles dogs, un filthy, unclean animals. Paul says these, these false teachers leading people astray not, not teaching them the truth of, of uh, the way of, of salvation. They are unclean, savage beasts. They are dogs. This is a strong warning to the church. He calls them, second, he calls them evil workers. They, they may look righteous on the outside. They may look like they're doing everything on the outside, but as they are pushing the grace of God to the side, as they are rejecting Jesus, thinking that their own good works could get them into heaven. He says, man, these are, these are evil workers. Self-righteousness, one of the greatest sins you could commit, thinking your own good works could get you to God and to his standard. He calls them evil workers. And finally, he calls them, or is that the third one? Or the mutilation, there it is, uh, the mutilation. Uh, third service, I'm tired of it. Uh, but he calls them the, the mutilation it's simply because uh, they, 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 they would maybe share, the, share about Jesus and say, yes, believe in Jesus, but also be circumcised. Also do this, and then you can enter the new covenant relationship with uh, God, with Christ, and you can be saved. Paul, Paul calls them dogs, evil workers, the mutilation. In verse three, he says, Beware of them, stay away from them, for we are the true circumcision. We know God. God has done something in our hearts. It's a spiritual matter. It's, no, it's not a, something of a, a fleshly matter. It's a spiritual heart work that Christ has done in us. We are new creations in Christ. God has caused us to be born again. We've been raised from the dead. In the spirit, we are the true circumcision. We, we worship in the spirit of God that God, is, that God accepts. We glory or rejoice or put our confidence completely in Christ and put no confidence in, in the flesh. It's a spiritual matter. We are the ones who know God. Now, now what's awesome about knowing God living this, and, and living this Christian life is it is responsive. As as, as We've talked about those four points, pouring out the pure heart uh, when others are in need because we know God. We need to realize living this Christian life is responsive. God has pursued us first. 
God has loved us first. I love Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the famous verse. By the mercies of God, before he commands you to present your bodies to God, a living sacrifice, he says, by the mercies of God, you have to understand the mercies of God. You got to know the love of God. You got to be wrecked by his grace and by his kindness and by his love. And then you can properly respond. Not out of this begrudging kind of obedience, but out of just being compelled to love him in response for, to his love for you. By the mercies of God, present your bodies. Then, then comes the command. Present your bodies to God, a living sacrifice. Peter does this in 1 Peter chapter 2. You see it all throughout uh, the New Testament. Peter does it in his way as he, as he reminds the Christians who they are. He says, as sojourners and pilgrims, and then comes the command, abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. He's like, remember first, okay, yeah, this is the command we ought to obey, but first remember who you are. You're a sojourner. You're passing through this world. You're a pilgrim. This is not your home. God has made you a citizen of his kingdom. You belong there forever. You belong a citizen you will live there. You'll get to know God more and more there. This is what God has done for you. Now respond properly. Abstain from those fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul that are here on this earth, that we experience here on this earth. It's all responsive uh, to what God has done first. He pursued a relationship with us. He did the work in our hearts. And so we, we look we need to keep looking to what Christ has done for us to respond properly. So as we, as we come to the communion table, as we come to the Lord's Supper, man, we're going to remember all that he's done for us. And it should compel our hearts once again. This should never become a, a, a thing just we do out of uh, compulsion or just it, going through the motions. We need to stand in awe once again that the creator came down to us. God Almighty put on flesh to die, to lay down his life for us. We need to be wrecked by this every day over and over again so we can respond properly. And God loved a sinner like me, cared for a sinner like me. And so then we can pour out with a pure heart when others are in need because we know God and being a worship leader, it's only fitting to read a, a, a chorus of a hymn as we close, um, just reminding us to put our uh, complete confidence in Jesus, to rejoice in what Christ has done for us as he uh, uh, completed all the, of salvation work for us on the cross. So I'll read this for us, then we'll pray together. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal, no respite, no. Could my tears forever flow. All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior or I die. Let's pray. 